So we're going to see that Mussolini's been doing this longer. He's more experienced. He's been successful. He's the prototype for the public works projects that Hitler has implemented. Those were all pretty tried in Italy first, bringing people into the infrastructure, building roads, etc. Also building up the military. <coughs> but he hasn't been as successful as Hitler. But he's been doing it. And, hit, and Mussolini already ventured forth. He broke the peace by invading what? Ethiopia, 1935. He's been booted out of the League of Nations. Nobody has actively taken him to the woodshed for doing anything. They're unhappy with him, but he still gets away with it. And that serves as a model for Adolf Hitler. If Benito can do it, I can do it. He's already got it going. So, expelled from the League of Nations, and then this vehement hatred towards socialism and communism. Remember that Mussolini came up the ranks as a what? Socialist. Socialist. And flip-flops after World War I, and becomes the most vehement, uh, vehement fascist going after communists. He's on a one-man wagon about going after the communists. So this is something that we've got to keep our eyes on. He's already done it, got his nerve band, so to speak, for it. And these are pretty strange soulmates. They get together and they seem to enjoy each other's company. And maybe it's because it's a peer relationship. You know, sometimes leaders, they get used to so many flunkies below them saying yes, 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 and honoring the leader, that they don't really understand until they're with another peer that there's another relationship that has to go on and they can talk candidly and they can cut through the nonsense that goes with politics and bureaucracy. And these two kind of enjoy each other's company. They're fast and famous friends for a long period of time. But that relationship begins to change. And it starts flipping in 1939. And it flips because of successes that Germany scores in Czechoslovakia. Mussolini comes to the strict realization that he is going to be frozen out of the game. He is not going to get any territory if he waits too long. And he's wondering, when is my friend going to cut me into the deal? When am I going to get land? Because remember, part of his whole dream that is expounded with the Italian people is the greater Rome. Remember, resurrecting the greater Rome. Trouble is, you're not going to get a Roman Empire if you've got a, uh, a rival who also is looking for Liebesram in Germany, right? So this is part of it. So he's got to modify himself a little bit. And he starts talking about the greater Venice. Remember, the Venetian Empire, 12 and 1300s, how strong that was, and how pervasive it was in the Balkans. Well, that's going to be a reality he'll start working from. And he feels, well, Hitler's not going to worry about El Albania, Yugoslavia, and Greece. Those were places that we traditionally were in control of. Those are what we would call our sphere of influence countries. Now, he's never really mentioned his dissatisfaction to Hitler. It's funny, you've got a good friend and you're not happy, wouldn't you kind of say, you know, I'm not happy? Hitler has been rolling, let's be honest. He's been happy, he's got everything he wants. Benito's just probably having a bad afternoon. Even though the canopies weren't too good at the buffet cartel. And that's part of it. He doesn't listen. They're not listening. And ambition is now starting to seep into the, the process. Other things that we see. Benito is going to move without conferring. The whole idea about the invasion of Greece and the timing in October of 20, October 28, 1940, is done solely by Mussolini and Mussolini himself. He's never mentioned this to anybody. And as we see the event unfold, it isn't even done in a proper way. There's an art to diplomacy, even in war. 
And when we get to the incident where the Italian ambassador is knocking on the Greek prime minister's door at 3 o'clock in the morning to tell them that they're going to war, take it or leave it, that's not proper protocol. Sorry, folks, you don't do that at 3 o'clock in the morning. I think even the Japanese, they might have been a little slow at typing on Pearl Harbor Day, but they presented their declaration of war to the United States during daylight hours, right? They didn't do it at 3 o'clock in the morning. Here, Mr. Roosevelt, we're at war now. Make a decision. So there's a protocol, and the protocol is not even adhered to. Mussolini is moving, he's doing it on his own. And this is what is scary. He's moving on his own, and he's not thinking, not thinking things through. Not only from the diplomatic point of view, because he's not conferring with Hitler. Hitler at the same time is trying to lure in Russia, and he's pacified them. And we know in October of 20, in October of 1940, Ribbentrop, the German foreign minister, is meeting with Molotov in Berlin. And Molotov is upset. What's going on? You're moving here, you're moving there. Don't you guys remember, we made this treaty, there were supposed to be spheres of influence. One of our spheres of influence, the USSR keeps telling the Germans, is we want to get out on the Baltic Sea. We want free access. We have this issue. And now all of a sudden, you seem to be encroaching down through Austria, Hungary, and you're now going to be in Romania. What's going on here? Explain yourself. If you're the Soviet Union, you're starting to see what? A noose put around you. He's beginning to wonder if this treaty is really in the benefit of the Soviets. And I told you a couple of times the last few meetings, how does Ribbentrop try to mollify him? Well, join up with us. We'll beat the, we'll beat the British together and everything will be okay. And he's telling them, telling him this, as he's sitting in a bunker at the German foreign ministry, and who's bombing a bomb? England. England. The RAF has given it to him. And at one point, Molotov says, and whose bombs are those? Yours? <laughs> so who's winning? You're not obviously winning the war if you're getting bombed yourself. So there is some deep suspicion going on here. And it just breaks the cycle. Hitler had been gracious to let Mussolini in on Anschluss, and he got his support, and he was very grateful for it. But after that, the breakdown between the two is, is occurred. They're not talking, and there's suspicion amongst both of them.